Hi, um, here is the latest uh, neonates in a nutshell, um, which we hope you will enjoy. So uh, I'm Amy and we've got Gemma here. Hello. Um, so today we're going to be looking at cranial ultrasounds and the role that um, they play on the neonate unit. Um, so just as a brief introduction, so we do use cranial ultrasounds um, a lot on the neonate unit. It's an essential part of newborn care um, and it's particularly useful for babies that are seen as high risk, sick and preterm. So sort of lots of the babies that we see on NICU. Um, the advantages to doing it is that um, they're very quick, so we can see things straight away. We're not waiting for results. Um, they are quite easy to do once you've been trained up um, and they're portable, so we're not having to take the babies all over the hospital to get scans. Um, they're also, so compared to other scans like MRIs and things, they're very cheap. Um, they are safe, so you get sort of limited side effects um, and you shouldn't need any sedation. For babies that are unsettled, you can sometimes do sucrose and containment holding, but if we get the positioning right, hopefully they should tolerate the procedure really well. Um, so the point of today's talk, we're going to look at why we do them, how we do them and the sort of things that we're looking at. So first of all, why do we do them? So there's lots of different reasons, um, but the main ones that we use on our unit, um, we're looking for any sorts of evidence of um, hemorrhage or um, parenchymal abnormalities, so basically just things to do with the brain tissue itself. So we're just looking for any problems and that's in preterm and term infants. Um, we're also looking for evidence of any congenital malformations. So in um, when people have had scans, if there's been anything found, we would just be checking to see if anything was going on once the baby was here with us. Um, also, any sorts of brain infections, so um, things like CMV, um, so things like that can affect like the brain structures. So that's something that we would do if any babies came onto the unit with specific concerns. Um, and any traumas, so if we had any really difficult deliveries, um, sometimes that can be if they have sort of blame, um, bleeds in different places. Um, and the most likely, the, the most common ones that we use are surveillance scans. So when babies first come, we will do um, scans initially and then we check them sort of weekly or two weekly um, to see how the brain's developing just to make sure that everything looks normal. Uh, how do we do them? So um, we use um, one of the fontanelles or the soft spots on the head and it's usually the anterior fontanelle which is sort of at the top of the baby's head uh, that gives us the best views. Um, however, if there was something specific that we were looking at, we can use the other ones. So you've got the temporal, the posterior and the mastoid um, fontanelles but as I said usually it's the anterior one so this is really important when we're thinking about doing the scans to get the baby in the right position and um, there's absolutely no reason why babies can't be prone for this procedure and often they sort of tolerate it much better because they're nice and comfortable um, so yeah sort of from our nursing point of view it's just important to get them in the right position so that we can get easy access to that but also that they can uh, be comfortable and what we're looking at, we do two different planes. So we're looking at the coronal one, which is sort of like the, the front on, it looks like a crown. Um, and then the sagittal plane, which is the sort of side one. And that's sort of looking at the brain split in two. Um, and it's important to look at both just so that um, we can be sure if there is anything abnormal, then it's genuine and it's not an artifact. Um, so, and we're looking for all the structures in the brain and also the ventricles, so these sort of C-shaped bits in the middle here which is where the um, CSF is so that's the things we're looking for. Um, so just briefly looking at the coronal plane views uh, when we take the images we tend to do sort of six to eight it depends on the quality of the image and how well the baby tolerates it um, but the idea is that you sweep from the front to the back um, and what you're doing is to start with, if you look at this one on the top left, um, that is, you can see um, the orbital ridge and the nose at the front of the baby. So this is the, the bone. You can see how bright it is. Um, and then as we sweep through, it's going to look at all the different various structures. And we're comparing the brightness really to the, to the bone, because if something's really bright, then that's an indication that there might have been a bleed. Um, so you can see here, I'm not going to go through all of the different things, although I'm very happy to go through in more detail if people are interested at a later time. Um, but the main thing really is to look at, for this one, we're looking at the ventricles, which are these two, um, how would you describe them, Gemma? Like banana shapes. Yeah, like spaces. <laughs> yeah, um, and we're just, and then moving through the, the bottom left image, you can see that's really bright. So they're the two sort of 
strips and that's actually the blood supply which supplies the ventricles so you can see so that's the sort of brightness that we're comparing so that's normal that those bloods um, that blood supply is there but if you saw that level of brightness in a different area you might be worried and then the final one is at the back and we're looking for the sort of maturation of the brain so how many um, all the sort of uh, the grooves to show that the brain is forming properly and again any bleeds um, with the sagittal one, so again, we're looking for any sort of bleeds, but we're also looking at the, the midline structures. So if you look at this first one, you can see it's kind of like a train track and it goes and that's the um, the nerves that we connect the two sides of the brain together. Um, it can be absent in some babies, so it's something we're looking for. And what we're really looking for is where the position is compared to all the other structures um, you can also see like these sort of wiggly lines at the top which again is the grooves of the brain and that shows that the brain's maturing quite nicely um, then when we sweep out slightly further to the side you can see this c shape which is in the middle that's the ventricles um, and so this has got as i says has the csf and that's what supplies the brain with all the nutrients um, and what we're looking for there is to make sure they're the right size and there's no um, dilation and there's no bleeds and things like that and then we swing straight out to the side and again you're just checking um, how does it look with all the grooves and everything um, I think that's it for that one um, so what is it that we're looking for so the most likely thing we're looking for is intracranial hemorrhage um, or intraventricular hemorrhage IVH which is what we we common call commonly call it and then other hemorrhages as well um, so it's one of the most important things that we do um, the reason if we have a baby under 30 weeks um, we do them nice and regularly so we would do them when they first come in on day one then we then do it again on day four seven and fourteen um, and then depending on what we find we will then carry on surveilling them every one to two weeks until they get to term um, it, they, uh, if you're going to have an IVH, it's most likely within the first 36 to 72 hours, um, which is why we do it so so frequently. And really, the the reason behind them, it, it's not exactly known, but we know that sort of fluctuations are not good for babies. So, if you get babies who have fluctuating blood pressure, CO2 levels. Um, pH, oxygen levels, lots of different parameters. So it's one of the reasons that we're really careful to, to monitor them and treat them sort of gently in those first few days just to make sure that we're not stressing the babies out. So, okay. Um, I'm going to pass on to Gemma, uh, Gemma in a minute. Um, but so just to say that when we're talking about IVHs, um, we're trying to move away from this grading system. It's kind of an old fashioned system. But, uh, what we try and do now is when we are looking at a scan, we're describing what we're seeing rather than just giving a number. However, it is still very commonplace that we sort of use this grading from one to four. So we're just going to cover it now and just show you sort of what we're meaning when we see them. Um, grade one IVHs, it's actually just outside the ventricle um, is called um, the germinal matrix and that's a sort of um, so the, you've got the blood supply supplying the ventricles um, and there's a really really fine network of capillaries and that's where in a preemie baby they're most likely to have a little bleed um, in themselves they're not that bad but they can extend so it's something that we would be wanting to look at so that's a grade one um, a grade two is when you've had a bleed and it's gone into the ventricle itself um, but it hasn't caused any problems as such. So it hasn't made it, the ventricles dilate. It's not causing any pressure on the system and it's sort of staying where it is. Um, grade three is where it's also within the ventricle, but it's um, it's actually blocking. And so it's causing dilation of the ventricles, which can put pressure onto the brain and cause hydrocephalus. And then grade four is slightly separate. It's any any level of, of bleed. It can be small or big, but um, it's actually gone into the brain tissue itself. So it's separate to the ventricles. It might include the ventricles as well, but any, any bleed that includes the brain tissue itself would be a grade four. Um, so overall, grades one and two tend to ge have generally good outcomes with babies not having any particular deficits, but grade three and four can be more devastating. Um, so you can get developmental problems um, and even death. Um, so I'm going to hand over now. Gemma's just going to talk through those. Okay, so we're going to look at grades one to four and we'll just describe the images so you can see what we're talking about so grade one up on the top left here um, these images show us a grade one bleed or a GMH or the germinal matrix hemorrhage so what you can see in the first picture there you can see the two ventricles um, with a nice curved shape to them 
And then on the right hand image, there's a little arrow um, which is pointing to an area which is the bleed. Um, so what's important to note is that it is small, um, but the, the color is as bright as the bone. So we know that this is blood, um, but the ventricle is still a normal shape and size. So that's a grade one bleed or a GMH. Then we move on to grade two, so the top two images on the right. Um, what we can see here is we've still got the curved shape of the ventricles, um, but again, the right hand image there, you can see that this bleed is a little more extensive um, and actually extends into the ventricle. But as I say, the ventricles are still a normal size and shape, so there's no evidence of any dilatation. Grade three, so down on the bottom left hand side. Um, if you compare the ventricles in this image to the grade one above, you'll see that they're much more spherical, globular in shape. Um, so this suggests that there's some dilatation. And then we look in the right hand image there, you can see that that C shape of the ventricle is enlarged, so dilated, um, and that bleed um, has extended. So it's within the ventricle um, as well, and you've got that dilatation. Um, so we know there's some sort of blockage there causing, causing that build up of CSF. And then our grade four bleed um, on the right hand side is, uh, is an extensive bleed. It's within the ventricle and it extends out um, and into the brain tissue as well, which you can see. So particularly on the ventricle on the right in the image, um, you can see that the ventricle's got blood in it and that extends out into the brain tissue as well. And those ventricles are also enlarged and dilated. Cool. Well done for doing that without pointing to it. It's very hard <laughs> describing it. Uh, okay, so that is IVHs. Um, for the last little bit of the talk, we're going to talk about something else that we look at when we're doing scans, and that is periventricular leukomalacia, or PVL. Um, so this is something that we do see in extreme preterms particularly, um, but you can also see it with babies who have uh, are known to have had an IVH. And also with babies who, if there's been uterine infection um, or prom. Um, and basically what's happened is like over time we've got much better at dealing with babies and sort of keeping them nice and sort of settled. And so we're reducing the amounts of the large IVHs we're seeing. But um, PVL is basically, um, it's sort of little areas of damage within the white matter of the brain so it's still areas where like, that brain has been starved of oxygen in little places so you get little infarcts and then over time those, those can break down and leave little cysts or holes um, you can imagine that this is devastating so um, it can lead to mobility problems such as cerebral palsy and, and it can also affect other areas depending on the bits of the brain which are affected so you can get things like visual problems or learning disabilities um, the thing with this is that when you first do a scan, it can look absolutely fine. Um, and then you will notice this um, within sort of two to four weeks after the baby's been born, just from these sort of general areas, perhaps of sort of, you know, profound desaturations or something. The exact cause isn't still known, but we know that, again, it's this idea of trying to keep things as calm as possible for the baby. Um, and you can get areas like single areas or multiple areas, um, but it does tend to be around the ventricles themselves. So I should just let Gemma chat through this. Okay, so we're going to um, just describe these images as well. So like um, the IVHs, PVL has a grading system and we grade it grades one to four. So we'll start with a grade one and two PVL, um, which is uh, the lowest grade, obviously. So they're the top two images. So initially looking at this, you might think, oh, there's not really anything... Um, odd there to see but what I want to draw your attention to particularly in the top left hand image you can see the two slit like ventricles and at the top of them there's just this area of brightness um, which is um, not as bright as the bone necessarily but there is that brightness there and we call that periventricular flare or blush um, so this is one of the first signs one of the things that we would want to continue monitoring for any changes so a grade three PVL, we're moving on to the images on the right here, um, just shows the development of that um, periventricular flare or blush. So like Amy says, you get small areas of infarct and then what can happen is you can get these cysts developing. So if you look at these images, you can see these small um, cyst-like circular structures um, on all three images, um, which just suggest a grade three. So that's, um, that PVL has developed further and we've, we've now got evidence of cysts forming, which means that we're losing some brain tissue. 
And then our grade four, um, we've got exten uh, like extensive cysts, which are um, very visible um, throughout the parenchyma. Um, and essentially where these cystic lesions form, as I said, you lose brain tissue. Um, and so we're losing some of those connections and communication pathways within the brain, which is why um, they, they can have such catastrophic effects. Okay, so the implications of PVL we have just touched on. So um, as you can imagine, if you've got all these sort of loads of little areas of problems within the brain, it can cause developmental problems and deficits. And depending on where it is, you do get a wide range. Um, so as I said, traditionally, there were motor skill um, deficiencies. Um, but we are better at sort of dealing with these babies and making sure with careful monitoring and things that they are hypoxic for less time. Um, so some of the things you get are sl slightly more subtle, um, but they can be just as devastating. So you might get cognitive and behavioural impairment. Um, and the importance is why we're doing these surveillance scans is that if we can see this, then we know that these babies might be affected and so that when we can um, watch them more closely and we can make sure that we get all of the developmental support in place to help them with their, all their different milestones. So just to sum up from all of that, um, so cranial ultrasounds as a, a, on the whole, um, so it's a very useful tool. Um, we use it to look at lots of different um, abnormalities in sick and preterm infants, but as we've said here, the majority of things we're looking at are the IVHs and then any development of PVL. Um, it's not as precise as other things such as MRI. Um, MRI is a lot more accurate. However, it's a lot quicker, easier, cheaper, and it's non-invasive. So it's a very good thing for us to use. Um, it's really important to look at the serial changes, as I said, so that you can see like what's happening as the baby's getting older. And also it's quite good if you've got an, an idea that there could have been an antenatal problem, you can sort of see from delivery and then see, or has, is it something that's developed while the baby's been on the unit? Um, it is really important to look at both planes just to make sure that it's a genuine problem if you found something it's not um, an artifact um, and it's good to look at previous scans as well um, it is useful to identify IVH um, and as I said increasingly used to in, uh, to do PVL as well um, and the the whole point of this is just so that we can identify those babies which are at risk of problems and get any necessary support in place for them so that is the end of the chat. I um, hope you enjoyed it. Any questions, please email us and we'll do our best to answer them. And if anyone's interested in more details of exactly what we're looking for and the different areas of the brain and things, let us know. We can do that. But I just didn't want to overwhelm everybody at this point in time. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed and see you for the next one. Bye. <laughs>